So um, I'm going to do an extension of uh, OCT. So are there any questions about uh, the material that um, that I've shown before? This is your chance about anything I told before. No questions. No questions. All right, so that's where we are then, all up to speed. Um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, OCT, uh, Doppler OCT and uh, polarization sensitive OCT. And uh, let's start with the Doppler OCT. It's the simpler one of the two. Um, so what we're trying to do is moving particle and, uh, and that would allow us to quantify, for instance, blood flow. And so the thing what is happened, uh, what happens is we have our OCT signal, let's say our coherence gate is within a blood vessel and then we have uh, the scattering of a moving target, moving particle. And um, now you would say, okay, I have a depth resolution of let's say 10 microns. So if my particle moves, by more than 10 micron between two consecutive measurements, I can determine that, uh, that displacement and I can calculate the velocity. Uh, but if you then look at the kind of velocities you get, they're very high. You need a large amount of motion. And we would like to measure uh, also small amounts of motion, so for instance, uh, a flowing uh, red blood cell. So the second thing we can look at is the interferogram underneath my coherence function. So I have my coherence function that's here, and I get this interference, it's an example and reference arm. Um, and uh, when I move the, the, when I look beyond the matching length between the reference and sample arm, I don't get interference anymore. <laughs> the interesting thing is that actually this fringe pattern encodes something on the length scale of the wavelength. Yeah, because I know I get my interference between sample and reference arm is here constructed. And if I uh, would move my reference arm, um, or if I move my object in my sample arm by half a wavelength, no, but sorry, by quarter of a wavelength, then my back and forth path is longer by half a wavelength, and that would turn constructive interference into destructive interference. So in a way, I am sensitive to motion of that, that object to within uh, a fraction of a wavelength. And the way I can exploit that is by taking first one depth profile and then a little bit uh, later, a time tau later, a second depth profile. And I can compare now these interference fringes and I can determine the phase at each location, at, uh, at say, uh, at this location. And then I can see that my phase has shifted for the second measurement. And so what I have now is a phase shift that I can divide by a time delay and unit frequency. And actually that gives me the Doppler shift. And we know what the Doppler shift is. That is when we have an, uh, uh, let's say a siren of a police car, but it's, when it's coming towards us, the pitch is higher. And when it moves away from us, the pitch is lower. The reason that the pitch is higher is because that sound wave is compressed. So the frequency that we perceive increases and when it moves away from us, these sound waves are actually extended and the frequency that we hear is lower. Um, so Doppler shift, and it turns out that we can, can get that Doppler shift by comparing the two phases of this interferometric signal. So the way we do it is we do one measurement 
we do a second measurement, we compare these two signals, we figure out what the phase shift is, and we have a measure for the displacement of that particle. Um, if you then uh, look at how that phase shift is determined, uh, these are the parameters that go into it, uh, four pi, n is the refractive index of the medium we're looking into, tau is the time delay between the two measurements, uh, v is the velocity of the particle, and you see that there's a cosine theta in here. And the cosine theta is the effect of the, the direction of the motion with respect to the direction of the incoming beam. You can imagine that if my flow is perpendicular to my OCT beam, my particle might have moved in between the two measurements, but it's a lateral motion. It doesn't change the phase. So I'm only sensitive to the, the velocity component along the beam. And so this cosine theta, that theta, is the angle between my incoming beam and the angle of the velocity factor of the particles. And uh, then we divide that by uh, the wavelength. Okay. And so this is then comparing the, the phases of uh, measurement one and measurement two. You can determine the phase shift and that allows you to calculate this parameter f and this parameter or you can go back and detect the flow velocity if you know the angle and that's a big problem and so this is a, uh, again a drawing of the configuration you have your flow at a certain angle you have your beam and theta is the angle between the light beam and the direction of the flow um, so we worked that out that the frequency difference is the wave vectors of uh, the light and the velocity multiplied by the, the flow vector. So these are vector units. So that's where you get the cosine in. And if you write in scalar velocity, divided by two pi. Um, and that leads to uh, this expression. So we can, uh, okay, that's where the derivation is. And so let me give you an uh, example. I'm not sure if this is a movie. No, it's not, it's a still. Uh, this is a, a normal standard OCT image of the retina, and then we can we can process it for Doppler. And what we did here is we just compared neighboring A lines. The separation in space between A lines is about 10 microns, so they're close enough to say, okay, these are overlapping A lines. I just look at the phase shift between neighboring A lines, and I pick up these locations where you actually see a shift. So gray means that there's a zero phase shift, and then black is a phase shift in one direction and white is a phase shift in the opposite direction. So you can see that then in this image, you can locate the locations of flow in this larger image. Uh, and then you can also see that it is actually pretty hard to determine small, the location of small blood, for, blood vessels in this retinal image. From the structural image, it's hard to figure out exactly where the flow is. And it also shows that you can measure these phase shifts for really, really small uh, blood vessels. This is on the order of the capillary. This is about uh, 20, 20 micron or so, that blood vessel. Um, uh, the other thing that you observe is that there is, uh, if you go, is, is anybody of you online? Can you check your your the video online? Because this, this projector is so bad that uh, I mean there's flow here, but you can barely see it in this projection. Yeah, can you share that with your classmates? Uh, yeah. So, see you both.
visible. Bar yeah, barely. But I mean, the point I want to make is that there's actually also an area of flow here. Uh, well, you can predict that because the So if you look at the at the structural image here, uh, you see that there is significant absorption in uh, uh, here up here because the RPE, the, 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 the signal is very low from the RPE compared to over here. Here you get a much stronger signal. And the reason is that the light is absorbed by this large blood vessel here. And then now that the blood vessel is really there, you can see it here. And the same holds for uh, this area here. There's a very large blood vessel and that gives this result here. You can see that the Doppler shift is not very clear in those two areas with the very big blood vessel. So you can see that here underneath it's a little bit scrambled. And that's because the velocity is so high that the phase starts to wrap and you do not get the proper uh, phase shift anymore. So you can go, you go to pi and then you jump to minus pi. So it gives you an ambiguous signal. But in the smaller blood vessels, the flow is lower, and there you get these really nice profiles of the flow inside the blood vessel. Uh, so this is another demonstration of that effect. This is a, a patient that was injected with the indocyanine green, uh, that is the or fluorescein, that is a dye, and you in, inject it into the artery. So first the arteries of the retina fill up, and then in the later phase the the the, the, the veins fill up. And so based on that, uh, on uh, a, time a time series of that fluorescence, you can determine what is an artery and what is a, a vein. So for uh, this is an early phase picture of the back of the retina. You see that the arteries are filled up and this is a late phase picture. And then here both the arteries and the veins are filled up with the dye. Uh, so that allows us now to identify an artery and a vein uh, in, uh, in the retina and we chose a location right here because then in one image, we, we, we could get both an artery and a vein simultaneously in, uh, in one particular cross section. So we did that at several locations, but I'm gonna show you which location I'm gonna show you location two. Location two is the video I'm showing. So here you have the structural OCT image. Work. No, no, it's not working. It's very weak. Can you still see it? My, my laser pointer is barely. Yeah. Uh, mouse. Here, you see my mouse here. This is, uh, uh, I think this is the red one. This is the, oops, this is the vein. The blue one is the vein. The red one is the artery. Uh, so this is the structural image. And then you look at the Doppler image. And you can see actually uh, the, the blood pulsating. You can see the heartbeat, heartbeat back into this pulsating uh, pattern inside these two circles. Uh, so what we did is we took those circles and we uh, quantified uh, the amount of phase shift within each circle and plotted that as a function of time. So here you can see then uh, the, the pulsatile behavior inside the red circle and uh, a very small pulsating component in the vein. Yeah? This graph takes this image and for the blue line, we look at the signal inside the blue circle and we calculate the mean phase shift within the circle. And that is plotted here uh, as a phase in arbitrary units. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so uh, this was a system that acquired about 30 frames per second. This is a total time span of about eight seconds. And so you can see then. Uh, with a resolution of, uh, what is it, uh, 33 milliseconds, uh, how the phase changes within the circle, basically the phase is then directly proportional to the flow velocity. Um, 
uh, just to give you an idea of the size, eh? so the circles are around uh, 100 micron in diameter, and the blood vessels themselves are on the order of 60 to 70 micron. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, a capillary, that is the smallest blood vessel in your body, has a diameter of about uh, 7 to 10 micron, and that is so small that the red blood cells actually stack up to move as a kind of a train uh, through these uh, very small uh, capillaries. So 60, you know, that is um, the diameter of six uh, capillaries. Uh, you can measure the heartbeat of the person. Uh, that was about 85, if I'm correct. One, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, one, two. About 10 in eight seconds. And the other interesting thing is there is some pulsatile behavior remaining in the capillaries, uh, sorry, in the veins. And uh, the, let's say the picture is that uh, you have your, your heartbeat, and so with pulses, the blood pumps through the arteries, but then it goes into a capillary network. And remember, all these blood vessels are are somewhat flexible, so they absorb the pulse. So you expect that after they go through a capillary network, they are collected again in the in the veins. That the pulsatile behavior is gone. That's all absorbed by the blood vessel network in between the artery and the vein. But you can see that if you look then in the retina, where this is actually very close together, that that network of artery and then going into the veins and then sorry, arteries, capillaries, network. Sorry, arteries capillaries about behavior in the, in the veins. Uh, this is then a, 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 a scan over a larger area where you in each frame do that Doppler processing. Uh, and again, you can see, well, that you can open your computer. <laughs> you, can, you can really see arteries and veins simultaneously in these images. Does it show? All right. Um, so, what we're interested in, in is in what is the minimum detectable flow that we can determine. And basically that is determined by the noise of our measurement. So let's say we, we measure a stationary tissue. We can compare two A lines and we can look at the phase shifts we get. We know it's stationary, so whatever the phase shifts we get is noise. That is our noise level and from that noise level we can calculate then what the minimum velocity is that we are able to measure it because we know the minimum velocity should give us a phase shift that is at least larger than that noise level that we have within our measurements and so uh, the, the minimum velocity that we can, we can measure The minimum velocity that we can measure is the basically we invert this formula where we have the velocity as a parameter as a function of all these other parameters. And instead of the measured phase shift phi, we uh, insert the noise floor of our measurement, the phase noise of our measurements. So that gives us the minimum uh, flow, velocity, flow velocity that we can measure. Uh, in the current approach, uh, the time delay between two measurements is 10 microseconds. Uh, the minimum flow, the flow velocity that we can measure then is ordered on the order of 10 to and millimeters per second. So if you then take a look at uh, the, the kind of blood flow velocities that we can expect in arteries and veins in the retina, uh, we see how did I organize this. Uh, here you see the time interval at the top between two uh, consecutive measurements at the same location. And you see that the first time delay that you see here is 0 0.01 milliseconds. So that is uh, uh, microseconds, that is 10 microseconds. 10 microseconds delay between the different measurements. And that is a uh, a very reasonable number for if you do two adjacent A lines. So you 
scan speeds is your two adjacent A lines with one another, and you can determine the phase noise. You did that in a measurement, it's 0.26 uh, radians. Uh, we assume that the blood vessel makes an angle between 85 and 89 degrees with the with the beam. And so it's not perfectly perpendicular, but it makes a small angle. So what does that give then in flow velocity, the minimum flow velocity that we can measure? It's about 70 to 89 millimeters per second. If we increase the time delay between two consecutive measurements, uh, we increase tau, and actually with increasing tau, we improve our flow velocity. We can measure smaller flows here on the order of uh, 0.4 to 2.1 millimeters per second. And if we increase that time to 1.25 or 2.5 or 5 milliseconds, we can go down to velocities of uh, 0.08 to 0.8. 0.4 millimeters per second. The interesting part is, of course, what are the clinically relevant flow velocities that one would like to measure. Uh, if you then look at the retinal and uh, central arteries and veins, these are the big arteries in, and veins in your, in your retina, that's velocity between 70 and 190. So you can measure that with your standard OCT, comparing just adjacent A lines. But if you want to measure retinal arterioles or capillaries, you get into flow regimes that are below one millimeter per second. And that require you to change your data acquisition mechanism where you're able to increase the time delay between two consecutive measurements at the same location. Uh, this gives you then an overview of what is needed. So how do you do that? Uh, that is what we call backstitching. And the, what happens is you basically scan a small area of the retina. You go back and scan that same portion again. Then you continue to scan. You step back, scan that same section again. Continue, step back, scan that same section again. And so with that mechanism, you can play with the time delay between measuring the same location. Uh, so the idea is, and you can see that in an animation, that this the measurement mean moves in a zigzag way over your blood vessel and then you can control the amount of time between measuring at measurements at the same location. Um, so let's see what we can do with that. So the prediction is if this method is as I think the two and a half or five minutes I forgot I think it's two and a half. So this is the retinal vesicle. Yeah. Now let's go back to the situation right now once ah it so that, again, it's all about the time delay yes, let's say that uh, the idea is that you want to go back after two and a half milliseconds or after five milliseconds mm -hmm. so you scan and after five milliseconds you go back continue and then you go back after five milliseconds and scan that again that's why it's a zigzag motion. How far you can get with your single scan before you have to go back depends on the time delay that you would like to have. Yeah. And then the previous slide kind of demonstrated that the ideal time delay is somewhere between two and a half and five milliseconds. The, the, the image that I'm showing you here is a full uh, raster scan of the retina. And this was just fast. One B scan, next B scan, third B scan, fourth B scan to scan the whole area. And we did the Doppler processing by looking at neighboring A lines. And the time delay for that was about 10 microseconds. I've shown you that, then we, that in that case, we can see the big arteries and the veins. Well, let's take a look at the picture of the retina when we process this, processed it that way. And indeed, huh? I don't know if you recognize it, but this is a optic nerve. Huh? That is where all the blood vessels come out and spread out over the retina. You can see the big arteries and veins in this image. Now, the next step is where we apply a time delay of about two and a half to five milliseconds between consecutive scans. And then this is the picture you can see. So we can see basically down to the capillaries. And can you open your laptop again? Because it's so much better.
I mean, you can, uh, on, on that screen, you can see that you can basically follow an artery here, going into smaller, smaller branches, and then you can follow an individual capillary going here around the, uh, the, 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 the avascular zone, being collected again in a vein and then coming back. And you basically can map out the full capillary network. And so uh, this is the power now of, uh, of OCT in the clinic. Uh, this is an uh, this is also a module that is implemented in many commercial systems now. Uh, it's it's called OCTA, and the A stands for angiography. And basically, this is the technique that they used for that. Um, this is another blow up of that avascular zone. Uh, does any one of you have an idea why why you would have an avascular zone in your retina? What, what location would that be? Where do you do not want blood vessels interfering with your vision? No. Straight right behind you. Yeah, it's the it's the fovea. It's that area where you have uh, one single photoreceptor. Each individual photoreceptor is connected to an individual nerve that goes to the brain. And so that's the only region where you have your high acuity, your, your, uh, your vision with which you recognize faces. So in that small area, it's about 300 microns, uh, one, one third of a millimeter. Also, there are no blood vessels running in that region to prevent, uh, you know, to optimize your, your vision. Okay. Uh, what was this one now? I think we'll just backstitch everything together. Okay. Now uh, I'm going to shift uh, a little bit to something different. Uh, it is related to the previous topic, and I'm going to use it to do a Doppler analysis in a in a different way. But before I do that, I need to tell you a little bit about the uh, laser speckle. Uh, have you heard of laser speckle? Have you any idea what it is? Yeah, what did he, how did he explain it? He mentioned it, okay. Dirk, how did you explain it? Uh, well, exactly like the speckle pattern that you could project on the wall. Yeah. yeah if, okay. if only I thought of bringing a laser point, which I didn't. Then, uh... I have one, but it's, uh, it's dead, it's dying. So it's yeah. very difficult what's happening uh if it were a bright uh, laser spot i would shine it on the wall and what you would see inside the laser spot is a very uh dense pattern of really high intensities and really low intensities and that all has to do with the roughness of the wall and the coherence of my uh, of my laser source so i'm, I'm going to explain it in this uh, slide here uh i'll have a laser beam that hits uh let's say a white wall and that white wall has a certain roughness as you can see here and that roughness is larger than the wavelength. So the idea is that I have my light hit the wall and then this is, this is me as an observer, this is my eye and I see uh, waves arriving from all these different locations on the wall coming together in this one point of observation. And each path length towards the observer here is different. So the phase with which each uh, field arrives is random. And what I observe is an E field that is the sum of all these individual E field contributions, E1 to E7, you can go on up to 100, each one with a different amplitude and phase. And what happens now if I look at that intensity in that observer spot, and I can do, I can make two changes. I can either move the observer around it laterally, around the, the, the spot that's on the wall, or I can change the wavelength of my illumination source. In both cases, the effect is that the sum, that random sum of all these phasors will change. And so the intensity that I observe will be different. To give you an idea, I'm going to write this. Uh, let's say we, we, we have a phasor sum of all these fields. 
we have a, this is a complex plane, and then E1 is this phasor. So it has an amplitude and it has a certain phase. So E1 is equal to A to the power i phi, where phi is my phase, and in the complex plane, that phase is this angle here, phi. So now I have my second field that is uh, coming. Uh, it's a sum of these fields. So I've written it as if E is E1 plus E2 plus E3 and so on. So I can draw my second phaser on top of the first one. And then I have my third phaser and my fourth phaser and my fifth phaser and my sixth phaser and my seventh phaser. phaser. And the intensity that I observe is the endpoint of the sum of all these phasers. So when I draw it this way, you can already see that probably this endpoint really makes a kind of a random walk through this complex plane when I change the amplitudes and phases of each of these individual phasers. So my, the, the intensity that I measure is basically, I can even describe it that way, as a random walk in this complex plane. And if you want to know the intensity, the intensity then is the length of this vector squared. It's also calculated, it can be derived. Tatiana knows how. Um, based on that random walk model, but I'm going to show you here now what does that intensity look like when i change either the angle or the location of my observer or i change the wavelength of my light source and you see that it is a wildly fluctuating intensity pattern it fluctuates strongly it's, it fluctuates so much that if i calculate the variance so uh delta i is uh I mean minus uh, sorry I minus I mean and I square this. This is my variance, right? If I calculate my variance, then the square root of my variance, that the square root of delta i divided by I mean is one. So that it characterizes a signal with a very high noise. The noise is basically equal to the intensity that you measure, to the mean intensity that you measure. And if you look at this signal, you can at least imagine that my average is probably around here and fluctuates wildly. So this is laser speckle. Um, but we can use this wildly fluctuating signal to characterize flow. How can we do that? Let's take a look at this volume here. So the idea is that with my OCT, I measure a signal from a localized volume in the tissue. And the volume is approximately given then by uh, uh, the, the, the coherence length, the LC, that is the, my depth resolution. And in the other dimension, it's given by omega zero squared. Uh, that is the, the diameter of my focus. And that is the diameter is in the x and y direction, that's why the diameter of the d gets squared, and then in depth it's the coherence length. That gives me the volume from which I measure the backscattered light in the OCT system. And I can, I can model that volume now as being occupied by a large number of scatters. As you see here in this red volume, you see these blue dots, and they depict individual scatterers. And then the intensity that I measure is the sum of all the E fields scattered by each individual particle. So it's like with the speckle, I get the sum of all these in individual E fields, where the E field is generated by an individual scatter. And now you can imagine that that, that that sum that I get, that intensity from this volume will fluctuate strongly when I start moving the particles in this volume. And so this is, uh, I'm going to show you a simulation. What you see in this plot is the phaser. The dot here is the endpoint of all the sum, the sum of all the individual E fields from the particles. 
And what I'm going to show you is what happens now if I flow this volt, the, these particles through my measurement volume, what does it do to that sum? And that is, if the animation works, is what you see now. You see the volume, you see the scatters flow through the volume. I look at the sum of all my E fields, and you see that that final vector, the intensity that I measure, makes this random walk through my complex plane. Okay, well, what happens now if I increase the flow? If the velocity of the particles through my measurement volume increases. I can just show you. I hope it works. The phase fluctuates much faster. And the step size, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I can do, if I want to quantify flow, I can also uh, look at how the, the, the phasor changes between my different measurements. And I need a lot of math, but in the end, I will be able to determine the amount of flow through my volume. And the other nice thing of this approach is that in this case, you're also sensitive to the lateral flow component. In this case, if this is the direction of my beam and I have my flow perpendicular to my beam with the Doppler effect, I'm not measuring a phase shift. There's no Doppler shift. But with this approach that I show you here, there is a change in the intensity that I measure. So I have become sensitive to lateral flow. So now you can, with this method, you can both calculate the lateral flow component, and with the Doppler effect, you can calculate the actual flow component. Uh, so now we're going a little bit more in depth. Let me see how I did that. Uh, the, 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 I'm going to show you more or less how it's done. I don't think I'm going to go into all the details, but Let's assume we have our first measurement. We measure an E field with an amplitude and a phase. Then we do a second measurement. That's given here. That's my so, so that's after a certain amount of time, my second time. And then measure the amplitude and a, and a phase shift, a second phase shift. So I can uh, by taking the product of these two fields, this one with its complex coinage, or I can take the ratio of these two fields. In both cases here, I end up with an amplitude uh, and phase difference here. I can end up with the, with the, with the here I end up with the ratio here, I end up with the product of the two amplitudes. Uh, so it turns out actually that this is a nicer method of doing. And the reason is that uh, the, the amplitude, the, the absolute value of the amplitude drops out because you always take ratio. And so you get the dimensions, dimension of parameter Q, and you get the parameter phi that, uh, that characterizes the phase shift. So what you do is you, you, you start to calculate something that's a decorrelation estimation with these phasor pairs. Huh? This, is a, this is a product of two phasors, so this is a phasor pair. Right? Phase pair ratio that you can use. Um, so, like I said, in the OCT volume, we have um, uh, we have uh, what we calculate is an overlap integral between the two measurements. So the idea is as follows: I can either say my volume flows or I move my beam. But the net effect is that if I move my beam a tiny little bit on a state particles is that I basically measure the same particles except at the beginning some particles will be dropped out of my volume and at the other end new particles will have entered my volume so I can model this 
by saying, okay, uh, Phaser I measure for measurement one. Then I do a second measurement, and that measures a slightly shifted volume. And so I will lose all the E field contributions from the scatter that are in this part of my volume, and I will add the E field contributions to the particles that are in this part of my volume. And so the the Overlap integral then uh, the the change in that overlap integral is determined by the by the, by the, the change in the amount of particles that I measure. So now I explained it with stationary particles and a moving beam. But the other way of looking at it, and that is reality, is my beam is stationary, but my configuration of particles moves through. And so if the motion is higher, then it means that if I do my the overlap is going to be a lot smaller between the particles that, that were there and that were, are, are also present in my second measurement. So the overlap between the two measurements kind of determines the, how fast my phaser is changing. So with that overlap integral between two measurements, I can calculate how fast the phasers change, and that gives me then a measure for the flow. Uh, and what is in it? Uh, it is the W0 is the, is the beam waste, huh? so that was if we look at the, the volume of my, my uh, measurement, it was W squared and the coherence length, so you can see that in the formula, the decorrelation alpha is proportional to delta x, that's my motion, over the size of my volume in x and y, and the change in, uh, in z direction delta z over the uh, coherence length of my source. I'll save you the math here, but the, 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 the nice thing that you can do with this is that you can calculate um, uh, this formula here, that's a probability density function. And so a probability density function completely characterize, characterizes the statistical properties of the object you're looking at. It's a very powerful thing. If you can determine the probability density of something that you would like to measure, you can do a lot of very nice things with it. You can calculate the maximum likelihood function. You can determine you know, from how, how many measurements you need and how, what kind of precision that gives you. Probability density function is a really powerful thing. Um, you're, we are able to treat the probability density function for these phasor fluctuations in these volumes. Um, what I want to do next is um, Yes. There are two parameters in this probability density. It's Q, which is the ratio of the amplitudes, and it's phi. It's the phase shift of the phaser. And we can calculate the probability distribution just for the phase, and we can calculate the probability distribution just for the, uh, for the phaser, for the uh, Q factor, the ratio of the two amplitudes. Uh, what is set out here, uh, beta is the amount of decorrelation. So if beta is uh, 0.8. Ah, yes. Uh, beta is here in the exponent. So if beta is very small, it means I have a small amount of decorrelation, which means I have low flow. And so for beta is small, 
this is the distribution of phases that I will measure. Let's say I do 20 or 100 measurements on my volume. I calculate the, the, the distribution of phase shifts that I measure between these two measurements. And then this is the distribution of what I get. And you see that that's centered around zero and it is fairly narrow. And for a small amount of flow, you expect these phasers to only change a little bit in the complex plane, so the phase difference are small. And the, when the velocity increases, so beta goes to 0.8, I get a large decorrelation in my phasers. Then this is the distribution of the phases that are measured. And then the same you can do for the ratio of the amplitudes for the different values of uh, beta for different uh, flow velocities, basically. Um, so this is, uh, and this goes back into the history of, uh, of uh, this technique. Uh, if you look at how people were analyzing Doppler shifts in retinal images, the dominant technique was uh, an amplitude-based method. The ones that I showed you, the, the images that I showed you, is a phase-based method. What you can see here is the relative error that you that you get on your measurement with the amplitude-based method. And you can see that the amplitude-based method, the, the error really blows up with the increasing velocity. If you look at the phase-based method, the red one, you can see that it's actually fairly constant over a certain amount of range, but there it stops. And the, the reason it stops is because your phase wraps. Your flow becomes so large that the phase shifts wrap from, let's say, approaching pi to wrapping around to minus pi, and the, the flow becomes indeterminate. So if you look at the complex method, these phase repair ratios, you see you have a very flat uh, response, very flat error over the whole velocity range that you would like to measure. And you see that. There are three regimes here, and these three regimes are related to the different delays that were, that were implemented between the measurements. Like I explained before, uh, if you want to measure the really low flow velocities, you need a large delay between the two measurements. Uh, these, if you now stitch two or three measurement regimes together, and here are the time delays, you can do 10 microseconds, 100 microseconds, and one millisecond time delay, if you then stitch these three regimes together, you can have a flow velocity that spans back uh, a full decade or two, uh, uh, up to three decades to get the full flow velocity. All right. I know this last part was hard to grasp. I just wanted to give you a flavor of uh, this part of the technique and hope you, uh, you remember that when you have a probability distribution of something that you would like to know more about, then you're in good shape. And we'll continue in uh, like uh, 10 minutes. All right. Years ago, Thank you, uh, that we developed this. Uh, so we've done all these measurements on intralipid. Uh, that is like, um, you know, standard uh, phantom to use. Um, but now we want to apply it to the retina, uh, red blood cells. And we know that the red blood cells not a point scatter and all theory is based on point scatter. So what's going to happen? And we're going to measure on real blood. So what we did in the last year is we built a whole flow system for to use real human blood. We're actually going to control the oxygenation level two of that blood. And then we're going to verify these experiments again on, uh, on real red blood cells as scatters and see if it still holds up. And if not, we have to come up with something to fix the difference between the theory and, uh, and real blood. Okay. Uh, let's shift to another topic. Uh, that is um, uh, light polarization. And so we know that an electromagnetic wave is an uh, oscillation that is perpendicular to the propagation direction and the the, uh, the counter example of a transverse wave is a longitudinal wave and that is a sound wave and sound wave doesn't have a polarization state so the fact that light has this uh, polarization state gives us additional information if you compare oct2 for instance ultrasound we can 
learn something by looking at the polarization state of the light that's reflected from tissue. And um, uh, let's first try and describe the different polarization states. So what, I've, uh, what I show here is a linear polarization uh, that is in a plane and it's in the Y plane. The, the electric field oscillates in the Y plane and then propagates in the Z direction. That is oscillating in the x direction. So it's the orthogonal polarization state and also still propagates in the z direction. So what happens now if I have both a component of my electrical field along the x and along the y direction? Uh, the way you look at it is that basically you have decomposed the E field into two vectors along the x and y direction. So the true electrical field is the sum of these x and y components. And so the true, oh, I already shifted it. Uh, the idea here is that you get the polarization state that's at 45 degrees with the x-axis oscillating again in a, uh, it's a linear polarization state. What happens now if I shift uh, that y component by I think a quarter of a wave? Can you imagine now what the, how that electrical field behaves along the z direction? I mean, I can give you a few clues. I can look at uh, this location. There, it only has a x component, so the e field is in this plane. If I go a little further and I go here, then my X component in zero, I only have a Y component. So now it's pointing in this direction. And if I look somewhere in between. Yeah, thank you. This is what happens. And so you see here the X and Y component in red and blue, and then you sum them up to into the E field vector and you see that that E field factor makes a rotation. And so this is a circular polarization state. It rotates. Okay. So um, how does the polarization state change when the light field interacts with different objects? And so what we can look at is the different effects that can happen to uh, a polarization state. And if you look at the this drawing can you tell me what is happening with the polarization state after this object compared to before what has changed the temperature in the x direction is smaller yes and in the y direction more or less the same yeah so what you see here is that uh, the x component of the polarization state is attenuated and the y direction is not and this is an effect that you call die attenuation basically you can characterize that object with two numbers how much does it attenuate the x direction and how much does it attenuate the y direction so it's a die attenuation basically <coughs> this is the effect of an absorbing polarizing filter. And the polarizer eliminates one polarization state. You can do that in several ways. One of them is absorption. So this would be the material that would be in an absorbing polarizing filter. Uh, the, then you look at the second drawing. Can you tell me what's happening there with the polarization states before and after. There's a change in, change in the phases between the two orthogonal components, right? In other words, you could say one um, polarization state is delayed more than the other. And you can also describe that as the material having a different refractive index. The refractive index depends on the polarization state. Right? The higher the refractive index, 
the more the wave is retarded traveling through the object. This is in this is in effect that is called birefringence or double 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 refringence. Well, whatever. It means that the material has two refractive indices. Where the refractive index that the light experiences depends on the polarization step. So we have di attenuation. We have birefringence, and then what is this one? What happens here with the polarization step? Rotate. Yes. So this is a this is a rotator. Uh, this is an effect for which you in general need magnetic fields uh, to create this. Birefringence is a is simple. You can create it in any. Uh, I'll show you that there's a lot of birefringence in tissue. Many tissue structures are birefringence. And the last one. Depolarization, complete loss of information. So the, 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 the polarization state after the object is not correlated anymore with the input state before the object. So you have lost all information. So these are, and now we have the four effects that change the polarization state when light travels through an object. Okay. So how can we use the polarization when the image in tissue? Um, we can use it to reject multiple scattered light. Uh, for instance, we look at the, the slab of material, we come in with polarized light, we look at the uh, transmission side, and uh, we can say, you know what? The multiple scattered light, most likely for that, the polarization state has changed to the scattering process. So if I put the polarizer behind my tissue in the same direction as my instant polarization, I can filter out more of the uh, scattered light and I remain there, I keep more of the single scattered light. Uh, I can also use it in reflection. I can look at the light that's been reflected from the tissue where I can say, well, if I scatter only once, most likely my polarization state is maintained. So what I can do in that case is I can put my input state into the vertical position and before my detector, I put a filter in the horizontal detection. And what I'm going to reject now is mainly the single scattered light. And what's the advantage of that? The single scattered light is mostly reflected at the surface. And so by looking at the cross polarized channel, I look deeper into the tissue. And then the, the third way you can use by the polarization is by looking at the changes that occur that are, are occurring in a predictable manner. And that is by refringence. By refringence changes the polarization state in a more or less controlled way. Uh, there are many by refringence structures in, uh, in, in biology. Examples are collagen, that is the material that keeps your body together. Uh, muscle, nerves, tendon, cartilage, all, all basically what you can say, all fibrous structures in your body are birefringent. So they show this type of contrast. Okay, so if we want to measure these polarization changes in tissue, what do we need to characterize of the detected light in order to be able to see these changes? Well, purely polarized light has three uh, variables. It's the amplitude along the x direction, the amplitude of the field along the y direction, and the phase relation between that x and y component. Uh, we have seen in one example was the polarization at 45 degrees, and the two fields have zero phase difference between them. If you look at the, the circular polarization, the two waves have a quarter of a wave uh, phase retardation between them. So amplitude x and y and the phase uh, difference between the two. Then we can add a fourth parameter that describes the degree of polarization, p. Uh, an example of uh, purely polarized light is a laser. Uh, an example of completely unpolarized light is sunlight. 
Edison, the light of the sun has not, doesn't have a preferred polarization direction. Okay. So um, degree of polarization, uh, I made uh, really random drawings here, but you see here a horizontal and a vertical component. And you look at the oscillation along the horizontal and vertical component and the phase relation between the two, you can see it's completely random. So this would be the description of unpolarized light. And if you then look at this vertical and horizontal component, you can see that over time they have a nice phase relation. And so this is then the description of polarized light. Um, so let's talk about um, uh, processes that can change the polarization state. And um, basically what you need is uh, well, I wrote it down. You need, a, uh, if you want to change the polarization state, the degree of polarization. So if you want to turn polarized light into unpolarized light, there must be some kind of transfer of information, transfer of phase. So inelastic scattering processes, for instance, absorption and then re-emission, that's where you lose the polarization information. The, then you have, the result is unpolarized light. If you look at Raman scattering, Raman scattering is also a process where you have energy transfer, so you lose that, that polarization information. Uh, fluorescence is another example. If you look at elastic scattering, actually in elastic scattering, there is no energy transfer. So in a way that phase information is still preserved and the light is still polarized. That, that feels counterintuitive because you can say, okay, if I look at light that is scattered by a large number of particles, the outcome is indeed unpolarized light. But the reason is that I have different paths and for each path, the polarization change, state changes in a different way. And in the end, it sums up and I get all these independent paths, I get unpolarized light. But in principle, the process of that scattering is something that is predictable and can still you can still predict what the polarization state will be after the scattering from a sphere or from a cylinder or so on so in, it's not truly a loss of polarization information in the elastic scattering process um, then uh, this is a trick question what happens when you have second harmonic generation do you have loss of polarization information based on the arguments above, what would you, what would be your argument? Ah, okay. Uh, that is when you use um, two photons to generate a photon with uh, double the energy or half the weight. So two photon imaging is a, is a process where you, you put the intense pulse later to the tissue tissue and detect light that is generated at the, so basically you translate the Greek graphic into a light in blue light. But it requires two photons to generate a new one. Now, if you don't have two photons, maybe it's a difficult question, but is the scattering in the last? Very good argument. Yes, it gets complicated, but you are in the right way. Yeah? So the, the way to look at it, it's not an inelastic process because we turn two photons into one. There's one photon, double the energy. There is no energy loss, so there's no energy transfer in the whole process. So in principle, it's a coherent process, and in principle, the polarization state will be preserved. Okay, so what happens then with these uh, 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 structures? Uh, what kind of structures can we have? So very common are microtubules or actin filaments, collagen fibrils, mice. In the fibers. And the interesting thing is that you can completely solve the, 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 the scattering 
by a cylinder. Has Derek discussed knee scattering with you? Knee scattering is a sphere, right? And for a sphere, you can uh, get an exact solution to the scattering. You know exactly what the amplitude and the phase is of, of the light that is scattered in the different directions. So that is Gustav Mie solved that in like 1890. That same math to solve for a sphere, you can use to solve for a cylinder. And what you can already see when you look at the scattering process from a cylinder is that if this is your cylinder direction and you look at the polarization state that's along the, five, uh, the fibers and you look at the forward direction because that, that, that cylinder scatters in the forward direction and you look at the phase of that scattered field. At the same time, I can take a horizontal oriented polarization state, I can scatter that of my fiber and I can look at the amplitude and the phase of that field that's propagating, that's scattered in the forward direction. Already that cylinder introduces a phase shift between the vertical and the horizontal component, like a, a retarder. And so is the cylinder, just the geometrical shape of the cylinder already creates that retardation effect. Okay. So you could call this form biofrenesis. So the, the, the biofrenesis is associated with the form of the object. You have also something that's called intrinsic biofrenesis, and then it's related to the molecular structure, the, the, the details of the molecular structure that you're looking at. Okay. Anyway, so fiber-like structures are already biofringent. Then we can look at stacks of uh, disks also that can be solved exactly. They also have uh, biofringent properties. So for instance, examples are then the rods and cones and the outer uh, segments of the photoreceptors. Okay, with that, uh, we can describe then the birefringence of these fibers. And uh, it turns out that we have a refractive index that is smaller for light that's polarized perpendicular to the fiber direction. And the refractive index of the material is higher for light that's polarized along the fiber direction. Uh, and then uh, if you would look at the fiber bundle, so let's say this is your fiber bundle and your light is coming in like this, then it's cylindrical symmetric. And so the material is not birefringent. It's only birefringent for light that's prop that hits the target perpendicular to the fiber direction. Okay, so we have this phase retardation due to form birefringence. And let's try and take a look at what happens and uh, for that, uh, this, is a, this is a drawing that red box is now a material that is birefringent. That could be a solid state, it could be a crystal, it can also be a bundle of fibers. And this is the input state that we have that is entering this, uh, this object. And the yellow and blue are the, are the field components along X and Y. And if we look then at what kind of polarization state we get for this one, we get a linear input state at an angle of 45 degrees. We travel through the material and then afterwards, the, the yellow and the blue are shifted with respect to one another. So the blue one is retarded more than the yellow one. And if I now look at the polarization state after this material, I can see that the polarization state has, has rotated by 90 degrees. It's now a linear state at minus 45 degrees. This is what I mean when I say that the birefringence changes the polarization state in a very controlled manner. It's very predictable what happens if we know what kind of material we have there. And, and we can use that now to use, to create contrast in, uh, in images. So for instance, if you look at uh, uh, the eye, uh, what kind of structures are Birefringent. What what do you think? What could be birefringent here in this in this eye? The veins and arteries because of the cylinders. Well, they, these are big cylinders. We're looking at, at smaller cylinders, at the muscle fibers. But what do you think? The cornea is that birefringent? It's a, it's, a, it's a lamella, very thin layers of fibers. They're birefringent. 
the nice thing is they're they're very nicely organized and they're very and they're stacked in very thin layers one to two microns so you have a layer with the fibers running in this direction then a layer with the fibers in this direction the net effects that you get a very clear object the cornea is very transparent but on the microscopic detail it's birefringent uh, the lens also a material that is birefringent we go to the retina um, we have the sclera, that is the basically the whole collagen structure. The white of your eye is collagen, and that's the structure that keeps the globe intact. Your eye is under overpressure, that keeps the sphere inflated. Uh, fiber structure. And then here, inside, what do you think is birefringent inside your retina? How does how do your the signals of your photoreceptors go to your brain? How do they get there? Nerves, yes, very nice fibrous uh, structures. So also the the nerve fiber layer in the retina is birefringent. So uh, if you, this is then an OCT image of the retina, and it's this layer on top. This is the nerve fiber layer that is birefringent. Yeah. Why is it birefringent? Uh, it's also an object that is uh, made up of fiber structures. Um, Uh, it's it's the same. So you you have how do you build? I mean, the the lens is not a, a fluid bag. It's not a, because if it were a fluid bag, it would not be birefringent, right? It doesn't have structure. But it's basically it's fibers inside and in very organized layers that make it very transparent. But it is a fibrous material. It has a certain elasticity to it. One more question, and I have to refer you to a biologist. <laughs> this is far as I know how it works. Um, the other birefringent structure in the retina is uh, Henley's fiber layer. That is this layer here. And this is a very interesting layer because you can see here the photoreceptors. That is that area where you have a one of one to one connection between the photoreceptors and the brain. So from each photoreceptor, an axon needs to go to the nerve fiber layer. So you basically get a spread out direction of fibers in this area. And that's what makes this this handy, the, the, this particular structure also fiber -fringent. It's You cannot see it on the OCT, yeah, these individual axons, but the, the polarization reveals that that structure is there. I mean, you look at this, you don't see any fibers, right? But I will show you images where it shows up. Okay, now the question. So we know it's an interesting property, but how do we measure it? How can we characterize the polarization state that comes back from the tissue? And so this is the, a very simple um, uh, setup to do that. Huh? We take our light source, um, we uh, put a polarizer in, so we have polarized light, we have our beam splitter, and the beam splitter splits the light into a reference arm, into uh, a sample arm, and then the light is uh, coming back, recombined by the beam splitter. And then in our detection arm, we use a polarizing cube to measure with one detector the horizontal polarization state coming back from our sample, and with the other detector the vertical polarization state coming back from our sample. Well, in order to create this interference, from the sample arm, we need the polarization state that is equally distributed all over the x and y direction. Uh, let me give you one example. Let's assume that from the reference arm, I get only horizontal polarized light back. So there is no light from the sample from the reference arm going to this detector here. If there's no reference arm light, can I see an interference pattern? No. So in order to see an interference pattern in order to detect the vertical polarized light coming back from my sample. I also need the vertical polarized polarized light for my uh, for my reference arm. So the ideal reference arm light that comes back to this detector is a 45 degree polarization state that would split equally 
over these two detectors. So that is what this order wave plate does. Actually, it does not create a linear state here. It creates a circular state, but even a circular state nicely splits in equal parts in the horizontal and vertical direction. So that is my reference arm. My sample arm, I don't need to do much, except that in this case, uh, there was a quarter wave plate in that uh, sample arm. That's not strictly necessary. You can do without. There, there's a reason why it's there, uh, but it's not really important. But the idea is that now you measure the interference on your horizontal and vertical detector. And let's look at the different possibilities that we have for that interference pattern on the horizontal and vertical detector. So on the top, I've shown you the vertical channel and the horizontal channel and the interference that I see in these two channels. And if you then look at this graph here, what is then most likely the polarization state coming back from my sample? Do I see interference in the vertical channel? You can say no if you think that it's right. No, there's no interference. Do you see it in the horizontal channel? Yes, of course. Yes, it's there. I see an oscillation. So that's the interference. So uh, from only from this example, you know now that the polarization state that came back from my sample is a vertical polarization, uh, vert horizontal, horizontal polarization state. Uh, it's even drawn it as horizontal polarization state. Now I observe this interference pattern in my two orthogonal channel. So the vertical channel measures an oscillating interference pattern. My horizontal channel measures this. What is the polarization state coming back from my sample? Yeah, linear. And the last one, what's the difference between these two channels? Phase difference resulting in the circular polarization state. So by analyzing the signals on my detector, I can completely characterize the polarization state that is coming back from my sample. And this is actually an exa example of a measurement. This is a muscle of a mouse. Uh, uh, you can see here the amount of light that came back in the uh, horizontal polarized channel. Here you can see the amount of light that came back in the uh, linear polarization at 45 and here in the circular state. And, and what do you see here happening now? You see it going from black to white to black to white to black to black. Basically, this means that for this U channel, black codes, for instance, for plus 45 and white codes for minus 45. So what you can see is that light changes from linear 45 degrees to here linear at minus 45 degrees. If I then observe in my other channel what happens, and this is the circular polarization state, here you can see black codes, let's say for left circular and white codes for right circular, so the other rotation direction. And so what you see when I look at the reflected light from different depths, it starts off with a linear state at 45, then the polarization state slowly changes into a circular state. And then if I look further deeper into the tissue, that the retard phase retardation accumulates, I end up again with the linear state at minus 45, then switching again to a circular state that's opposite of the previous one, and then going back to uh, black. Where was I? Well, I think black here back up again to my original linear at plus 45. So you can see here, you've, you have visualized how the polarization state is changing as a function of the depth from which it was backscattered in the tissue. And it's cyclical. So this is a, a significant amount of pyrofringence in that material. What you also can see now is I have given these different states a parameter. You see there are Q, U, and V. And these are the this is the, this is the Stokes formulation to characterize the polarization state that is coming back uh, from the tissue. Q 
plus one. Let me add that in the next slide. So Q is one means that I have a horizontal polarization state. Q is minus one. I have a vertical polarization state. U is one. I have plus forty-five. U is minus one. I have minus forty-five. And V is one or V is minus one. These are two circular states. Okay, either a right-handed or left-handed circular polarized light. Then we can get to the degree of polarization. Uh, remember, uh, we can characterize the polarization state, but we can also characterize the amount of intensity that we're getting back. That is the parameter I. If you go back to uh, this image here, uh, the, when, we, when we just look at the total amount of intensity that is backscattered from the tissue, we get an image like this. That uh, this would be basically the exponential decay of our uh, lombard pierce law in intensity. Um, so now we have characterized these, uh, we can characterize these, these, these Stokes parameters, Q, U, and V, and then we can write down, this is the definition of the degree of polarization. It's the Q component squared plus the U component plus the V component divided as the square root of that, and that divided by the total intensity. And if this is one, then I have a degree of polarization that is one. And if it's zero, then I have unpolarized light or I have sunlight. Uh, you can see that for the Stokes parameters, there are four variables, eh? Q, U, V, and intensity. Uh, no, sorry, Q, U, Parameters. When I was talking about characterizing polarized light, we only needed three parameters. Eh? For the purely polarized light, we need an E field along X and Y and a relative phase. The Stokes vectors also include that depolarization effect. So that's the fourth parameter. Um, and uh, okay, this is again a, yeah, he needs to go. It's still very interesting. But, uh, what do you think with OCT? Can you measure uh, depolarized light? Can you measure the depolarization process in the tissue? But what do you need to create unpolarized light? You know, I can say I can create unpolarized light by taking a beam that is vertically polarized and adding a beam to it that's horizontally polarized. But they come from different sources. So there's no phase relation between the two, the fields coming from each of these sources. I can take, for instance, a, a lamp and polarize it, and I take another lamp and it or polarize it in the other direction, I add these two beams, I create unpolarized light. But I also know what happened now in the phase relation between those two. Can you create 45 degree polarized light out of this? Yes or no? What do you think? You think yes, right? Yeah. Anybody wants to think no? You don't know. Okay. It's not possible because your sources are uncorrelated. So, what if you like these two polarized light beams coincidentally reach each other and their phase difference is 45 degrees? Okay. So, this is the interesting point, right? you can look at an infinite time slice and indeed in an infinite small time slice these two fields have a phase relation and it could create a polarization state of 45 degrees but you look a little bit later or earlier in time and the idea is that these two sources are random emitters so they emit the electrical field with the random phase so if you go back in time 
but originally was a nice phase relation between the two sources that created 45 degrees a little bit earlier, a little bit later in time would be completely different and could create another polarization state. So I can, I can look at an infinitely small time slice and I can say, yes, my light is polarized. But then a little time slice earlier, it's a different polarization state. And a little time slice earlier, it's a different polarization state. So your polarization state is something that is consistent over time. And when it randomly fluctuates, then it's not a, then it's not a polarized uh, beam anymore. It's unpolarized. So it has all to do with the coherence between the two orthogonal components. You need a loss of coherence between the two orthogonal components to create a polarized light. Now you go back to the principle of OCT. What do you do in OCT? Eh? Your, your, your sample, your, your reference arm beam is completely coherent because that came out of the source. I polarized it, you know, that's a nice coherent beam. And so my reference arm is a nice coherent field that arrives here and is split in equal parts. And what happens now if I get unpolarized light back from my sample? The whole they don't correlate. Sorry. They don't correlate. So they they lost the ability to interfere with the reference arm line. So if you have a process, you need loss of coherence in elastic scattering and so on, then the light is not interfering with the reference armor anymore. So the whole principle of OCT is relying on that coherence effect, which also means you cannot measure the depolarized component coming back from the sample line. You can only measure the coherent part. It's only the coherent part that is used. Okay, so we are at this point where I said we also have the degree of polarization as a parameter uh, to completely characterize the polarization state of light. But what I'm also implicitly telling you, or maybe now it's explicitly telling you, with OCT, we cannot measure it's completely coherent. So means um, P is always one for what we measure. Yeah. In OCT, it's always one because I measure in my OCT setup the interference between the reference and the sample arm. So the, the sample arm light needs to be somehow coherent with the sample arm. Sorry, with the sample arm light needs to be coherent with the reference arm, otherwise it won't interfere. So the receptor P is one for it. It should be one, yes. Yes. And what happens now, people measure degree of uh, depolarization in tissue. How is that possible? Huh? Well, it's a, it's a trick. What happens is um, what they do is they compare different locations. It's in the tissue. So they say, okay, I measure the polarization state that's coming from this volume, and I measure the polarization state from my neighboring volume and from my neighboring from my neighboring volume, and I can average over that. And then it turns out that certain tissue structures that back reflected polarization state changes very rapidly. And then they call that depolarization. But strictly speaking, it's not uh, with ODT, you cannot measure depolarization. And why is it now possible? Because you average over an area. That's how it becomes depolarized. Uh, maybe this is a good moment to take a break before we go to uh, something that is called the uh, Poincaré sphere, which is a way of representing Stokes vectors. And then why do we like Poincaré spheres? Because birefringence is a transformation of a vector in the Poincaré sphere. So you can really visualize what the Birefringent object does to the polarization state by looking at the action in the plant ratio. So you are entitled to a 15 minute break again. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, if you look at uh, the Stokes vector, this is now four component vector. Right? It's the intensity and it has the Q, U, and V component. So it's a four component vector. It's also, it's a real vector. And then if you want to describe transformations of this uh, vector, you would need a four by four real matrix. Uh, that would be then a Muller matrix to describe how a polarization state is transformed. Okay. And so um, you can represent this, this Stokes vector in a punk array sphere, where this sphere, one axis is the U axis, the other one is the Q axis. And you can see this as a sphere. And any point on the sphere is a pure polarization state. If the vector becomes smaller than one, then you get depolarized light. So yeah, you can completely describe now a polarization state in this sphere. And if it's on the sphere surface, it's a pure state. The degree of polarization is one. Now the interesting thing, if you look at the at any polarization state in this in this sphere, you can predict how it how it transforms under birefringence. Because birefringence is always a rotation around a axis in the QU plane. So in this equator plane, it's an axis in the equator plane. The birefringence is a rotation around that axis. And why can you accept that it's uh, uh, that you have then you know a degree of freedom in terms of what is your rotation axis? And you can imagine that by your birefringent material, fast axis, slow axis. This is then, let's say, this determines the optical axis of the material, your fast axis, but it could also be at this angle or at this angle or at this angle. And that explains why you have a rotation axis that varies in the QU plane. The other thing that you learn from that is um, what would be the ideal polarization state to probe this birefringence. And in other words, you would like to see the polarization state change due to the birefringence. What would be the best state to use if you don't know the axis around which it rotates? And let me give you one counter example that would be a very bad idea. Okay? Let's say my optical axis around which I rotate is this U axis. If my polarization state is now incident with the U state, if my polarization state is U state, so at 45, will that polarization state change due to the birefringence? No, because it lies along my rotation rotation axis and that, that is the effect that I have my optical axis is along the 45 degrees angle my incident polarization state is also at 45 degrees will my polarization state change when I travel through the sample no it won't so with this knowledge and the knowledge that my rotation is around an axis in the QU plane what would be my best in Good state. V, yes, very good. The V state is always maximally affected by a rotation around any axis in the QU plane. Okay. Remember this quarter wave plate in my sample art. That quarter wave plate turns the linear incident polarization into a circular state. And that's preferred because then I always pick up the birefringence of my sample. Yes, but that is okay the, because uh, the the thing is that I, what the thing I want to pick up is the linear birefringence of my sample. Mm -hmm. So I prepare it into a circular state when it hits the sample, then it comes back. Yes, it changed back to another state, but the the changes in the polarization state have already taken place. Okay, so then uh, this is then uh, the, the thing that happens. We have here the optic axis around which we rotate, we come in with a circular state, we rotate around that axis, and so delta 
the amount of rotation is now the amount of birefringence of the material. So we can describe our circular input state that's a factor 1001. And my output factor is given by this one. So it's basically a transformation in, uh, in, uh, in the Poincare sphere. And even we can, reduce, we can reduce it further. This is a four component factor. If I say that there is no depolarization, then it's basically only this three components that change. Then it's a, then it's a three by three matrix, which describes rotations in a sphere. That's why I was referring to this other three group rotations in the sphere. Okay, so that is the Stokes <laughs> factor uh, approach, visualizing this, this birefringence effect. Let's go now and turn to Jones matrices. So Jones, the Stokes vectors act on intensities. The Jones matrix acts on fields. So what we have here is we have an incident field E that is characterized by its horizontal and vertical component, where H and V in this case uh, are, um, are so H is uh, A1 E I phi and V is A2 I1 phi 2. So components of uh, the electric field together making up my field vector. And um, after, so here I have my input state, I have a material and I get a certain output state at the exit. So I have my E prime is the result in electrical field after the object. So I can describe that whole transformation with matrices. So I can take my input field, multiply it with a two by two complex matrix, and I get my exit state. And this matrix is then the Jones matrix. It's uh, composed of four complex numbers. Uh, so in principle, this matrix has then eight independent variables. Uh, we're dealing with fields. So I can extract, let's say, a common uh, scalar field uh, phase factor out of this matrix. Uh, yeah, because if I look at intensity, then the intensity is given by the field multiplied with, with its complex conjugate. So looking at intensity, this phase vector would completely disappear. And I end up with seven independent variables in my matrix. And uh, actually, you can assign to each of these independent variables of the polarization effect, birefringence and diattenuation, actually. Um, So this is a bit of old news because when we, let's say we probe the sample with one input state and then we measure the result. That, measure, that means we can measure uh, three variables. We can measure the amplitude along the horizontal, the amplitude along the vertical and the phase relation between the horizontal and vertical component. I can do a second measurement with an orthogonal state I again can measure three variables, but I know that I have seven unknowns in this matrix and I have six equations. So in principle, you could not solve it. The, the next slide, uh, set the next slide. No, a few slides later, I'll show you how we fix this. But right now you can measure this complete matrix in one go, all parameters, all seven independent parameters. Okay, but the idea is that we have this Jones matrix formalism. And what is the nice thing about the Jones matrix formalism is that we can put two objects after one another. And I have my first matrix, Jones matrix, describing the first object, my second Jones matrix describing my second object. So what is now the combined effect of these two? Well, it's the multiple. So we can split up. Uh, all the polarization effects, let's say for a tissue, in small layers. We have a small layer of tissue that is Jones matrix one, the layer behind this, Jones matrix two, the layer behind it, Jones matrix three. And we can measure this depth resolved. So we can basically slice up the tissue and for each slice of tissue, determine what 
that Jones matrix was for that particular thin layer. So that is now basically the state of the art, what we do with polarization sensitive OCT, we can measure these Jones matrix for every layer. And in the way we do that now, where we solve the problem of six measurements of seven unknowns, is that we measure these two states basically simultaneously. And that means that this state and this state are not independent anymore, they're correlated, and that solves for our seventh unknown variable. So how do we do that? Uh, we have our system. We use a swept laser source. Uh, and the, the trick is in the sample arm here. You see in the sample arm, let me see if it, uh, yeah. In the sample arm, we create two different paths. Uh, let's look at the yellow part. So we have our beam, it goes through a polarizing beam splitter, two mirrors, again a polarizing beam splitter, and it's coupled back into a fiber. So the polarizing beam splitter uh, splits it into two orthogonal polarization states. So I have the green one, let's say, is the vertical polarization state. Now, I also have a red path. The red path is the horizontal polarization state. And what I do now, I make the green path and the yellow, the green path and the red path different length. So basically, in my sample arm light, I've coded with two orthogonal polarization states that are delayed in depth. And so when I create now an OCT image, I create a depth profile, and here I get my horizontal detector and my vertical detector, but I scan on, and further down in depth, I get a second image, and that second image is my orthogonal state. So with one measurement, with two, with polarization prepared in this manner, I create four images. State one, horizontal vertical detector. State two, horizontal and vertical detector. In a way, these four measurements I can describe as a Jones matrix or as a two by two complex matrix. But my measurement is now a two by two complex matrix that is changed by the Jones matrix of the of the tissue. So uh, not going to go further in detail, but the idea that you have to get is yes, we can completely characterize uh, the, the tissue because we have a full set of measurements that describes uh, from which we can extract the effects of uh, the tissue. I'm going to show you a few examples. So uh, here, the top one are two structural OCT images of the retina. Here we're looking at the fovea, that area of, uh, of highest uh, acuity, uh, the one-to-one -one connection of photoreceptors. And here we look at the optic nerve head. And around the optic nerve head, you get all the, well, it says it already, nerve head. All the nerves of the eye leave the, the eye at the optic nerve head and goes across towards the brain. So very close to the optic nerve head, you get very thick layers of uh, nerve fiber. And so... Oh, what we did is we looked at the orientation of the optic axis because we can extract that from our information. And what you see here color coded is the direction of the optic axis around the fovea. And you see that it's a nice centered pit, right? That pit here, this is exactly that area of highest uh, acuity. And because from that area, all these film fibers run out towards the, the nerve fiber layer to go towards the brain, you get this nice radial pattern of the fiber direction. Then you look at the optic nerve head, uh, you get these thick bundles here, you don't see it, but it's hard to interpret from these colors. You can present it in a different way, but it means that you can see bundles run like this uh, from the optic nerve head out towards the, towards the eye. Uh, then uh, this was an interesting technique for glaucoma, because in glaucoma, what happens is this nerve fiber layer thins, and that is an effect, uh, and it leads to blindness, blindness, but it is unknown why that nerve fiber layer thins. It has to do with death of, uh, of the ganglion cells, or it has to do with constrictions in the optic nerve head itself, 
uh, associated with glaucoma is the increased ocular pressure. So you can imagine then that there is more pressure on these nerves leaving the globe towards the brain. It will net effect is these nerve layers thin. And this polarization then is a nice effect to characterize this nerve fiber layer. So this was a technique, it's called scanning laser polarimetry. What they measured is uh, the, the polarization state changes of the light that were reflected from the from the eye. And then you see here these bioprinting structures. These are the nerves. And then we can do the same now with OCT. We can also map out the bioprinting of the nerve fiber layer and characterize that for this subject. And then the interesting part was, of course, what happens if you look at the glaucoma patient. So here, I have to be careful of the glaucoma patient, yes. So here you see, you know, you see same subject. Um, you see the phase retardation that was measured with the OCT. And if you, if you, you know, know a little what you need to look for, you can see that this bundle here is significantly thinned with respect to uh, what you see in a healthy subject. So this is the healthy subject. You can see yeah, that's it. Attentie, attentie. Dit gebouw sluit over 15 minuten. U wordt vriendelijk verzocht dit gebouw. Dat is een mistake. Hmm? Uh, well, you can see the difference, right? This is still work in progress. Uh, glaucoma research is really difficult because these, the thinning of this nerve fiber layer happens over years. So you need to do studies that run over five years with like 400 patients to get to significant results. So not easy. Uh, glaucoma patients. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to switch back and forth between the, the Jones matrix formalism and the Muller matrix formalism. And the, the main reason is because you can map your Jones to your Muller. So they're basically the same. Uh, but, uh, you know, one has an advantage over another in certain areas. So now we're going through an analysis method where we actually use the Muller matrices. Um, so we can we can change that Muller. Sorry, we can map that Jones matrix to a Muller matrix. And what we're going to do now is we're going to instead of these slices of Jones matrices, we're going to make slices of Muller matrices. So every layer in the tissue has its own tiny, let's say, delta. Uh, Muller matrix. So we can describe the change in the Muller matrix as a function of depth, like if we take a derivative with a matrix M, which, in, which you can also take as describe as the logarithm of your original matrix. So the the the, the nice thing of uh, uh, writing it as a as a derivative is that uh, this matrix M. Uh, gets a very simple form because it only describes changes from one layer to the next. It's like you have a function, you have a full function, but let's say you're you 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 only interested in the first derivative. You do a Taylor expansion, you just take the first derivative, and that characterizes now it, Taylor expansion. Then with only first derivatives, it's, it's only valid for a very small distance from your point where you take the derivative right but if you look at these small thin layers it works fine so we have our Muller Muller formalism and when we look at the Muller formalism this four by four matrix I already told you that if we ignore intensity then we just look at a rotation matrix the three by three so that's this part here and this part here you can correct.
it's like a fire drill right first you scream fire fire and then 15 minutes like oh no 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 just uh, <laughs> um, this part is a rotation matrix a three by three rotation matrix um, which is now that rotation in the Poincaré sphere and then if you look at this diagonal here this is basically the attenuation of the signal in the tissue so this is how the how the signals attenuated and if you then look at that that uh, derivative matrix m little m it looks like this so here you have your e to the power minus a uh, z uh, that would be would be an attenuation if i have a minus sign here that's your exponential dk uh, lambert beer over very thin tissue slice if i take the derivative of this matrix i end up with a matrix that looks like this where this alpha is on the diagonal and my eta my eta which was here basically my rotation in the Poincaré sphere and again the amount of rotation was the amount of birefringence so i end up here with the birefringence at these two locations in my small matrix m so there are very nice properties now to this small matrix and the derivative of the Müller matrix because I get basically I get my alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Let's ignore those. These are associated with depolarization. That should not be an issue when we work with coherent light with OCT. So we're only interested in this sub matrix, this three by three matrix where we have alpha being the attenuation of the light and my uh, components mu, mu, and eta. And this mu, mu, and eta, I can write as a vector, mu, mu, eta, three dimensional vector with a certain length. And now comes the nice thing because these components of the vector uh, uh, are associated with the direction of the optical axis in my material. So this vector mu nu eta mu nu gives me a vector that describes the optic axis in my material. And the length of that vector is the amount of birefringence, the amount of the rotation of my state in the Poincaré sphere. Okay, so what can I do? I can calculate this vector. And now I can look at a certain area in my tissue is that consistent because the idea is if i take you know a muscle bundle of muscle and i measure within my muscle bundle then i expect to measure the same direction of my optic axis that's a nice linear structure so if i have if i'm measuring muscle i will measure consistent directions of this vector over a certain area if i measure in a noisy region or an isotropic region, you know, I will measure a vector, but it can point in any direction. So averaged over a certain volume, and this is the effect I will, I will end up with basically uh, an, an, uh, random direction of this fiber. So I can, sorry, this optic axis. So what I can do is I can come up with a metric that is called uh, optic axis uniformity how uniform is the optic axis over a certain volume in my tissue all right remember that because we're going now to um, actually uh, creating a system that can measure this birefringence in tissue and the example i'm going to show you is uh, lung tissue we're going to look at um, the the muscle layer that is around the lumen in the lung but first we need to get into the lungs so we need an endoscope and the endoscope that we chose to develop is one that has a motor at the tip with a little mirror on top of the motor axle the motor spins around and then you know the beam comes out and like a lighthouse we scan uh, a circular area and then we can make a slow pullback and we create a whole volume of a lumen uh so this is then the kind of uh, catheters that we work with this is a diameter of a millimeter and then you can see here a motor that is built in in the machine shop uh, downstairs 
uh, with, uh, with the length of about a two and a half millimeters. Here you see the axle, here you see the prism that, reject, that reflects the light out. Here you see a green lens that creates more or less a focus beam just outside the cathode ray sheath. Um, so this was a, a very exciting moment, at least for me. This was the first time we went into a human patient. So what are we looking at? This is a, a, a patient. This, this is a tube where you basically a breathing tube for the patient. You can see the ribs. This is a rib of the patient. This is a rib of the patient. So the image is taken somewhere here. And then if you look very carefully, you see a tiny black dot here. This is uh, x-ray. Uh, the black dot that you see here is a tube that's being brought into the lung and to the periphery of the lung. And that tube has a metal ring at the tip. So the surgeon can see where the tube approximately is biopsy in this region of the lung. Uh, well, he does that by growing in with the probe. The probe freezes the tissue around a piece of metal and then he rips it out and he has a tiny biopsy from this uh, area. But uh, just before he's going to take the biopsy, we were allowed to uh, stick in our little uh, probe. And what you see is this tiny little dot here. I don't know if you see it in the background of my dying laser. I think it's right here. It's uh, the motor from our catheter. And then this image here is the pullback. Here you see the, the kind of structures that we measure then uh, in the lung. Uh, you see here, uh, this is uh, mucus, uh, uh, slime. Uh, and you can see the, the different layers in the lung. These are the motor wires, so they, they're copper, they reflect a lot, so that you don't see the tissue below the copper wires. And these are the kind of uh, images that we can create now. Uh, have you heard about the attenuation coefficient? Uh, that is how strongly the tissue will attenuate, right? Uh, so these OCT images, uh, the way you've been looking at them so far, are in from these depths. But uh, the intensity that comes back from each, each depth is not um, related to the tissue structure because it has that exponential decay, Lambert Beer's law on top of it. So it's very difficult to interpret these images. So what we can do, we can turn this into images. And now, what you see here is basically the tissue property. You see how much light is reflected back by each type of tissue. Uh, it's a very simple method, but it's very elegant and powerful, I think. And so here you see the structure. In this image, uh, here you see the amount of birefringence. So you can see in this image, it's very difficult to actually visualize that amount of birefringence. This image shows you if the optic axis is uniform. So here, this layer really jumps out. So this is that muscle layer that is just around the lumen of the lung. It has nice uniform orientation, so nice uniform optic axis, and it really jumps out. And then with this, which once you see where the optic axis is, you also recognize now it's very faint, but there is here a ring of virofringes in the tissue. But the, so it turns out that you know we were asked this virofringes effect. It turns out that the optic axis is much. Uh, it provides much better contrast for the type of structures that we would like to look at. Um, so let's go now into why would we even look at that, uh, that, that muscle layer in the lung? And the reason is uh, uh, asthma. So what happens in asthma is you get uh, uh, a shortness of breath. And it's created by the fact that the muscles around the lumen of the airway constrict. And so that makes it hard to breathe. The reason that it constricts has to do with, uh, uh, how, do you, how do you say that, uh, when you're up, uh, allergens, uh, dust, now you name it, um, complicated reasons, but this is the effect. And somebody who has regular asthma attacks, it's like going to the gym, this muscle layer becomes stronger. And, and 
at the same time, then the severity of the attacks increases. So the, 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 the fact that these, 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 the thickness of that muscle layer is an interesting parameter to look at, especially since there is a, a, a therapy that is called bronchothermoplasty, uh, where they try and damage these muscle layers. But if you want to do that, you first like to know, is it thickened? And why do some patients respond well to the therapy? Why don't others, others respond? And right now it's unknown because you cannot visualize that muscle layer in vivo in a patient. Okay, so this is the effect of the asthma effect, right? Uh, this is the treatment that they have developed for it. Bronch bronchial thermoplasty. You go in with the catheter, with the uh, one. See, you basically heat the tissue, and with the, the heating, you try and damage that muscle layer. Um, so, what is the what is the uh, measurement protocol, at least what we try to do, we try to do OTP imaging, treatment, and then uh, six months after the treatment image, the same patient. Uh, unfortunately, we managed to do that with only one patient, I think uh, three, two or three patients only after the therapy. This is this a movie? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So here you see histology of the tissue. And there's uh, something I would like to point out here that is, uh, you see these folds here? Oh. You see this fold here? Basically the tissue is folded, right? So, uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is a stain that just stains the muscle layer in the, uh, in the, in the tissue. Uh, so the desmin stain stains the muscle, and the H and E is a standard stain that we use for uh, for um, uh, histology most of the time. Now we're looking at these uh, these two images here. This is your uh, okay. There again is a big difference between my screen and that screen. For the movie, it would be nice. Just. Get, uh, but let me point out a few things. So I told you about these folds huh, that you can see in the histology. If you look in this image, you can see these folds too. They're present. They're here. This is a fold. There's a fold here. Right now, it's not that obvious. And it's definitely not visible in this one. But when I run the movie, you will recognize now these tissue folds now that I've shown you where they are. So let's see if you can, if you can see them. Especially here, right on the top. Nice to see the folds. And if you're not convinced, uh, how does it look on your screen? Yeah. Let's see. Same. Oh, okay. A little bit more brighter. I hope they're convinced. I recognize them. The clinicians do by now. Uh, so uh, the difference between structural and attenuation coefficient imaging anyway, so, uh, but uh, that's not our goal, right? Our goal was that uh, birefringence. Uh, here, you see an example of a cartridge ring. And if you look at the histology, uh, these are, this is cartridge that is present in histology. This is not the same histology yeah, because you cannot get histology from an in vivo patient unless you go through that very invasive procedure of a cryo biopsy, the example that I showed you earlier. But they, they rarely do that yeah, because you see all kinds of complications. And if, you, if you're unlucky, you create a hole in the, in the wall of the thorax and your lung deflates and so on. Okay. If you can do it with OCT, it's the, all these risks are, are minimized. So. Oh, wait, this is a nice one. This is an image where you go from that standard structural imaging to attenuation coefficient imaging. And I hope that you see that the cartilage that is here, that it shows much better up in the second type of image. But 
you know, we're not, that was not our goal. Our goal was that smooth muscle layer. So let me see when do we get to that. Uh, this I already showed you uh, that we were looking at the uniformity of the optic axis. Um, and that we can extract that shown here. And this is then the kind of uh, volumes that we create with the feedback. So you see here a three dimensional structure. Uh, you can see here the optic axis. So you can nicely visualize where these, um, uh, where you have this, uh, these fiber layers. Oh, and it rotates. Look at that. Optic axis, and then uh, oh yeah, this is this location of the optic axis. And why do we want to know that? That's because the muscles that we're interested they have their fibers lying in, laying in the circumferential direction. But you've also muscle the fiber of collagen that is kind of randomly oriented. So if you truly want to um, uh, quantify the muscle layer, we look only at uh, birefringent layers where the orientation is more or less circumferential around the uh, lumen of the lung. And in this case, in this movie, it's that green layer here, bluish green. That is the layer that we would dissect out as the muscle layer in, the, in this lumen. Uh, this is another example, then. This is where we have a really thick muscle layer uh, with nice uh, uniform orientation of the optic axis. Uh, this is the segmentation part, how we quantify it. Uh, what's this? this is a movie. Oh, no, this is, this is the same patient before and after at what we think is more or less the same location. And the reason why we think it's the same location is because of this, this part of the structure and this part of the structure that also appears uh, in the top image. It's you know, maybe hard to see, but they, the, the part of the structures are more or less matching. There's, it's here, and here, and here. Start them simultaneously. Let me see if I can. So now they're more or less showing the same region before and after. Anyway, the, 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 the most important thing is, of course, the quantification. Uh, this is then the uh, same, we measured multiple lumens in the lung, uh, four or five different areas per patient. Uh, this is then uh, the same area before and after. You can see that the the smooth muscle area has decreased after the PT treatment compared to before. And if you then, um, this, is a, uh, this is a comparison of the measurement that we did with biopsies that were taking, taken of these patients. So this, this, this is then really research. So in a very select group of patients, they go in and they take multiple biopsies within the lung. And at the same time, we do this R imaging from the biopsies, they can determine the airway smooth muscle percentage in these biopsies, and we can plot that then against our determined muscle uh, percentage in these images. And you can see you get a very nice uh, uh, linear correlation between the two. Uh, with blue, the, here, this one is the pre uh, treatment patient, and this is the post treatment patients, so within the same patient. That's also, also very nice if you can measure something within the same patient, that this thing gives you the, in general, the best significance. All right. Yeah, and this is me in the... Okay, I think that is my lecture.
Any questions? All right. I'm super happy about this eh? because, like, uh, you know, how, uh, the first paper on polarization sensitive OCD was in 97, 98. I wrote that at that time. And so we're now 25 years later, and finally, you know, we're in the clinic doing a measurement that is actually needed. So it's a long path. It's a long path. Why are so few people measuring the you are, uh, two slides back, you said there were about three people or one people, or yeah, the, the from. Why are there so few people? Yeah, why, why, do, why do we have only four patients, right? Yeah, yeah, there's really minimal number. So the, 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 the difficulty is the, was the catheter. So the first catheter that we built had models that were unreliable. And so they would stop running. Uh, uh, and, you can imagine that, so they make the machine so it would take them months to build one or two catheters. When you use them in the clinic, you know, certain the clinicians are not careful, they break them, they break down by themselves, they don't run. So, you know, I think uh, the first catheter was like eight years ago. I think finally now we have the recipe down and we can build catheters that last for uh, 25 patients. So the catheter that I showed you here, the picture, uh, that's uh, that that uh, catheter has uh, performed a hundred pullbacks, uh, which is uh, and so it's uh, it's uh, it goes into my collection of uh, special catheters. Yes. <laughs> and, and and since uh, July we're down because they need to build the new one. So that is the main problem. Oh, this is very tightly regulated. Uh, it takes a long time to be able to do these measurements in patients. For instance, you need to write an investigative medical device dossier, which describes our instrument and describes the measures we've taken to make it safe. So there are always, you know, serious cold conditions, like for instance, we uh, we shock the patient with the current. So that is an unacceptable risk. So we have to build in two layers of protection to avoid that happening to the patient. Uh, uh, is the material biocompatible? So our catheter needs to be made of a material that you can put into the patient. Uh, it's like all these things, the glues that we use, is the, is the catheter cleanable and how clean is it? Is it after a cleaning procedure? So the hygienist of the hospital inspects our catheters and you know, says, for instance, well, you know, you have screws there, it's gripping, get stuck in the, into the groove of the, of the screw, so I don't approve of this design. You have to go back and check this. So it's very tight and very good. Then uh, you also need ethical approval. So the ethics committee of the university. Of the, of the medical school looks at our research proposal and, and they determine whether the risk for the patient uh, justifies or the benefit of the research justifies the risk to the patient because there's always a risk to the patient with this clinical research. So they look at that and they determine whether or not you're allowed to do that. And so you have to design your experiment to minimize the risk for the patient so the board allows these experiments to take place. And the, the, the benefit we have is that we work then with the lung group at the AMC that has a lot of experience, is a leading group in the world to do this type of research. And so they, you know, they have built that reputation due to their scientific publication with the, with the review board, the ethics review board, that they are allowed to take these biases to patients. Because, you know, they take in 50. 15 biopsies in this case. We even, it might surprise you, we have approval now to go to healthy patients. And we, get, we have 10 healthy volunteers, completely healthy people that will go through this procedure of the biopsies and our imaging just for this research purpose. Yeah, it's, in, it's difficult, it's involved, uh, and, but in the end, it's rewarding.
I research is much easier. Okay. Uh, maybe that's an interesting story. So when we built the first OCT machine, we brought it to an ophthalmologist. Maybe I told you already. Did I? Yeah. Yeah, and then they wouldn't let go of the instrument. <laughs> I couldn't get. All right. Thanks. Uh, Dirk, we're done. Thank you, Jonas. Except I'm stopped. Yeah.